Chapter 1 Mr. Mr. pointed at the dynamite around his waist. I pull this, he said, and we die. The old black man got into the elevator behind me. He smelled of smoke and cheap wine and life on the streets without soap. His beard and hair were half gray and very dirty. He was wearing sunglasses, and a long, dirty coat hung down to his knees. He looked fat, probably because he had all his clothes on. In the winter in Washington, the street people wear all their clothes all the time. They can't leave any of their clothes at home because they don't have a home. The old man didn't belong here. Everything here was expensive. The 400 lawyers in the building who all worked for Drake and Sweeney were paid an unbelievable amount of money. I knew that because I was a Drake and Sweeney lawyer myself. The elevator stopped at six. The man hadn't pushed an elevator button. When I stepped out and turned right, he followed me. I pushed the heavy wooden door of a big meeting room. There were eight lawyers at the table inside, and they all looked surprised. They were looking behind me, so I turned. My friend from the elevator was standing there. He was pointing a gun at me. Put that gun down, said one of the lawyers at the table. His name was Rafter. He was a hard man in a courtroom, maybe the hardest lawyer that Drake and Sweeney had. Suddenly, a shot hit the ceiling. Rafter's eyes opened wide and his mouth shut. Lock the door, the man said to me. I locked the door of the meeting room. Stand against the wall. We all stood against the wall. The man took off his dirty coat and put it carefully on the large, expensive table in the center of the room. He had five or six red sticks around his waist, tied there with string. I had never seen dynamite before, but they looked like dynamite to me. I wanted to run and hope for a bad shot when he fired at me, but my legs were like water. Some of the lawyers were shaking with fear and making noises like scared animals. Please be quiet, said the man calmly. Then he took a long yellow rope and a knife from the pocket of his pants. You, he said to me, Tie them up. Rafter stepped forward. Listen, friend, he said. What do you want? The second shot went into the wall behind Rafter's ear. Do not call me friend, said the man. What would you like us to call you? I asked him quietly. Call me mister. I tied the eight lawyers with the yellow rope. One of them... Barry Nuzzo was my friend. We were the same age, 32, and we had started at Drake and Sweeney on the same day. Only our marriages were different. His was successful and mine wasn't. He had three kids. Claire and I didn't have any. I looked at Barry and he looked at me. I knew we were both thinking about Barry's kids. We could hear police cars outside and noises as the police entered the building. Mister pointed at the dynamite around his waist. I pulled this, he said, and we die. For a second, we all looked at each other, nine white boys and Mister. I thought of all those terrible shootings you read about in the newspapers. A crazy worker returns to work after lunch with a gun and kills everybody in his office. There had been killings at fast food restaurants and playgrounds, too. And those dead people were children or honest workers. Who would care about us? We were lawyers. Time passed. What did you eat for lunch today? Mr. asked me, breaking a long silence. He spoke clearly, and, from the sound of his voice, he had had a good education. He hadn't always been on the streets. I had chicken and salad, I said, surprised. Alone? No, I met a friend. How much did it cost for both of you? Thirty dollars? 
Mister didn't like that. Thirty dollars, he repeated, for two people. You know what I had for lunch? No, I had soup. Free soup from a shelter, and I was glad to get it. You could feed a hundred of my friends for thirty dollars. You know that? Yes, Mister. Call your boss. There was a phone on the table. I called Arthur Jacobs. Eight hundred lawyers worked for Drake and Sweeney around the world, but at seventy-nine, Jacobs was the oldest of the partners here in Washington. He answered at the first ring of the phone. Mister Jacobs, Michael, are you okay? Wonderful, I said. What does he want from us? I spoke to the man. What do you want, Mister? Soup with bread, said the man. Get it from the shelter at L Street and Seventeenth. They put a lot of vegetables in the soup there. One soup with bread, I said into the phone. No, said the man. Get soup and bread for all of us. Mister Jacobs, I said. I heard. I can hear him. A shelter for street people does carryouts. Mister Jacobs, please just do it. He has a gun and dynamite. I put the phone down. You said the man. He was talking to me. What's your name? Michael Brock. How much money did you earn last year? Don't lie. I thought quickly. I didn't lie. A hundred and twenty thousand. He didn't like that. How much did you give to poor people? I don't remember. My wife does that. Thank you, Mister Brock. Mister pointed the gun at the other lawyers. He asked all of them the same questions. Nate Malamud, the only partner in the room, earned more than a million dollars. More than a million, Mister said to him. I know you. You walk past me when I sit on the sidewalk every morning. You never give me any money. Why can't you help poor people, homeless people? Nate was a big man with white hair. He had been with Drake and Sweeney for thirty years. He was red in the face with embarrassment now. I'm sorry, he said. Who did the eviction? Said Mister suddenly. And again, who did the eviction? Nobody spoke. None of us understood him. But Mister wasn't looking for an answer. He looked out the window. Maybe he was thinking. Maybe he was dreaming. Maybe he was watching the police out there. Our soup and bread arrived half an hour later. There was a knock on the door, and somebody outside shouted through the door. Your food, Mister shouted back. If I see a policeman out there, I'll kill these men. Then he pointed the gun at my head. The two of us walked slowly to the door. Unlock the door and open it very slowly, Mister said. There was nobody outside. The food was on the floor near the door. As I stepped outside and bent down to pick it up, I heard a shout, "Stay down!" A policeman stepped quickly out of the office opposite and shot Mister through the head. Mister fell without a sound, and my face was covered in blood. Whose blood? Mister was lying on the floor. Half his head had gone, but the sunglasses still covered one eye. His hands were nowhere near the dynamite. Policemen came running from all the offices. "Are you hurt?" one of them asked me. I didn't know. I couldn't see. There was blood on my face and shirt, and a liquid that I discovered later was part of Mister's brain. Chapter Two. Devon Hardy. Who did the eviction? Mister had asked. But I guess he already knew the answer to that.
A policeman led me to the first floor of the building where friends and family and doctors were waiting. The doctors crowded around, but where was my wife? Six hours in a room with a gunman, and she hadn't come to see me. It was funny, really, because my wife, Claire, was a doctor herself at one of the biggest hospitals in Washington. I lay on a table for ten minutes while doctors examined me to make sure I was all right. Then my secretary, Polly, arrived. There were tears in her eyes as she put her arms around me. Where's Claire? I asked her. I called the hospital. She's working. Polly knew there wasn't much left of the marriage. Are you okay? She asked. I think so. I'll take you home. I was pleased someone was telling me what to do. My thoughts came into my head slowly. It was like I was underwater. We left the Drake and Sweeney building by a back door. There were police cars everywhere and ambulances and television vans, even a fire truck. I'm alive. I'm alive, I realized, smiling for the first time. I'm alive. I looked up to heaven and said a very big thank you. When I got home to our apartment on P Street in Georgetown, Claire wasn't there. I sat in the empty apartment and thought about her. We had met the week after I moved to Washington. I was just out of Yale with a great job. She came from one of America's oldest families. We were in love, we got married. But Drake and Sweeney make you work very hard the first year. I worked 15 hours a day, six days a week. I saw Claire on Sundays, and we went out together when I wasn't too tired. For the last five years, I had worked about 200 hours a month. That's eight hours every day for six days, with two or three hours on Sunday. But young lawyers at Drake and Sweeney don't complain about long hours. Fewer than one in ten become partners, and everybody wants to be that one in ten because you earn at least a million dollars a year. Claire was good about it for the first few months, but then she got tired of having a husband who was never there, and I didn't blame her. There are a lot of divorces at Drake and Sweeney, Long hours at work, each hour paid for by a client, are more important than a happy wife. By the end of our first year together, Claire was unhappy, and we weren't talking together very much. She decided to go to medical school, and I thought that was a great idea. Drake and Sweeney were telling me that I was a possible future partner. I just had to work even harder. When Claire was studying, I didn't feel so guilty about that. But Claire didn't just study. She worked unbelievably long hours. She had decided she wanted to be a great doctor. Soon we were playing a crazy game called I Can Work Harder Than You, and another game called My Job Is More Important Than Your Job Because I'm a Doctor Lawyer. My boss, Arthur Jacobs, of course, was on my team. He had become a partner in Drake and Sweeney at the age of 30, the youngest ever partner. And he would soon be the oldest ever working partner. The law was his life. All three of his divorced wives could tell you that. I woke up suddenly. I had fallen asleep in an armchair at the apartment, and Claire was sitting in a chair next to me. Where were you today? I said. At the hospital. At the hospital? Nine of us are in a room with a crazy man and a gun for six hours? We get lucky and escape? Eight families come and see their relative because they're interested in whether or not he's alive? And how do I get home? My secretary drives me. I couldn't be there. Oh, no, of course you couldn't be there. How silly of me. 
I couldn't be there because the police asked all doctors to stay at their hospitals until the situation at Drake and Sweeney ended. They always do that when there's a possible shooting. Oh. Did you call? I tried. I guess there were a lot of people trying. Next morning, we made breakfast together. We ate in the kitchen, watching the small television. The six o'clock news showed the Drake and Sweeney building, and you could see Mister looking out of the window. The television news said the dynamite wasn't real. The sticks were made of wood, and Mister had painted them red. The gun was real enough, though. It was a forty-four stolen. Mister's real name was Devon Hardy. He was forty-five. He had fought in Vietnam. He had been in prison a few times for stealing, but he wasn't a big criminal, and he was homeless with no known family. That morning's Washington Post had more details. According to someone called Mordecai Green, the director of the 14th Street Law Center, Devon Hardy had recently lost his job. Then he became homeless. He was living in an old warehouse. This wasn't unusual. A lot of homeless people move into empty buildings because they have no money for their own place. Devon Hardy had recently been evicted from the warehouse as an illegal squatter. Lawyers are responsible for evictions. Who did the eviction? Mister had asked. But I guess he already knew the answer to that, and now I knew it too. Drake and Sweeney had thrown Mister into the streets. Chapter Three, Mordecai Green. Mordecai Green was a warm, caring man whose work was on the streets. He was a lawyer with a heart. I had told Polly I would be at work today, the day after Mister came into the office. But for the first time ever, I didn't go to work when I was well enough to go. Just as it started to snow, I got into my car, a Lexus, and drove through the streets of Washington. The snow came down harder and harder. I just drove. Polly's voice came over the car phone. She sounded worried. Where are you? Who wants to know? A lot of people. Arthur Jacobs wants to see you. You have clients waiting for you. I'm fine, Polly. Tell everybody I'm at the doctor's office. Are you? No, but I could be. I drove around Georgetown, not going anywhere, just driving. The clouds were dark. The snow would be heavy. People were hurrying through the snow on the sidewalks. I saw a homeless man and wondered if he knew Devon Hardy. Where do street people go in a snowstorm? I called the hospital. I wanted to ask Claire to meet me for lunch. But the hospital said Claire was busy and they couldn't contact her. That was the end of our lunch together. I turned and went northeast, past Logan Circle, into the gang area of the city, and drove until I found the 14th Street Law Center. I parked at 14th and Q, certain that I would never see the expensive Lexus again. The 14th Street Law Center was in an old, tall, red-brick house that had seen better days. The windows on the top floor were protected by pieces of wood over the glass. The door wasn't locked. I went in slowly, out of the snow, and entered another world. It was a law office, all right, but there was no expensive furniture here, not like at Drake and Sweeney. I stepped into a large room which had three metal desks, each covered in files. There were more files on old pieces of carpet on the floor. The computers and the only photocopier were ten years old. There was a large photograph of Martin Luther King on one wall. The office was busy and dusty and interesting. You looking for somebody? 
asked a woman at a desk with the name Sofia Mendoza on it. She looked Mexican. She wasn't smiling, but I did. It was funny. Nobody at Drake and Sweeney would talk to a visitor like that. They would lose their job. But I would soon learn how important Sophia was to the 14th Street Law Center. I'm looking for Mordecai Green, I said. But just then he came out of his office. Sophia went back to her work. Green was an enormous black man, at least two meters tall and very heavy. He was in his early fifties with a gray beard and round red glasses. He shouted something about a file to Sophia and then turned to me. Can I help you? I want to talk to you about Devon Hardy, I said and gave him my Drake and Sweeney card. He looked at me for a few seconds and then looked quickly at Sophia, who was speaking in fast Spanish into the phone. Mordecai Green walked back into his office and I followed him in. The office was a small room with no windows and the desk and floor covered in files and law books. Sit down, he said, but you might get dirty. What do you want? I sat down. I was in the room with Devon Hardy when he was shot, I said. I couldn't think this morning. I didn't want to go to work, so I came here. Any idea why he did it? Because of the eviction, said Mordecai Green. A few months ago, he moved into an old warehouse at the corner of Florida Avenue. It wasn't a bad place for a homeless person. It had a roof, some toilets, and water. Who owned the warehouse? Mordecai pulled a thin file from one of the piles on his desk. It was exactly the one he wanted. He looked at the file for a minute. The warehouse was owned by a company called River Oaks. And River Oaks lawyers are Drake and Sweeney? Probably. Is that all? No. I heard that Devon Hardy and the others got no warning of the eviction. But you can evict squatters with no warning. Oh, yes. You can't evict tenants without a warning, though. Was Devon Hardy a squatter or a tenant? I don't know. I thought of another question. How did Devon Hardy know about Drake and Sweeney? Who knows? He wasn't stupid, though. Crazy, but not stupid. I had taken enough of his time. He looked at his watch. I looked at mine. We exchanged phone numbers and promised to stay in contact. Mordecai Green was a warm, caring man whose work was on the streets, protecting hundreds of nameless clients. He was a lawyer with a heart. On the way out... Sophia didn't look up from her conversation on the phone. The Lexus was still there, covered by an inch of snow. Chapter 4 Mom and Dad Welcome to the world, son. You think the guys in factory jobs like what they're doing? You're getting rich. They aren't. After I left Mordecai Green's office, I drove around and around the city while the snow fell. As a lawyer with hours to work, which my clients paid for, I couldn't do this sort of thing, just moving with the traffic, not going anywhere. But I was doing it now. I didn't want to go back to the empty apartment. I didn't want to go to a bar, either. I'd probably never leave. So I drove. I went through poor parts of the city I had never seen before. Then I went back to Drake and Sweeney. I went up in Mr.'s elevator again, walked along the hall to my office, and sat down at my desk. For the first time, I wondered how much everything in my office had cost. The expensive old desk, the red leather armchairs, and the Persian carpets. Weren't we just chasing money 
here in this building? Why did we work so hard to buy a more expensive carpet or an older desk? Was that a good reason to work? Was this the life I wanted? In my expensive room, I thought of Mordecai Green giving his time to help people who had nothing. I had about ten pink telephone messages from clients on my desk, and none of them interested me. I didn't like this work. My clients were big companies, and I worked on their lawsuits against other big companies. The lawsuits continued for years. Maybe a hundred lawyers worked on each one, all sending paper to each other. Polly came in and brought me cookies. She put them on the table with a big smile before she left for home for the day. A couple of lawyers came in, said, How you doing? and left again. They were probably on their way home, too. Alone in the office again, I picked up one big file and then another one. Which lawsuit did I want to work on today? I didn't want to work on any of them. I couldn't do it. It didn't make any sense to me now. I went to my computer and began searching our client files. River Oaks was started in 1977 in Hagerstown, Maryland. It was a private company, so it was difficult to get information about it. River Oaks was the client of a Drake and Sweeney lawyer called Braden Chance. I didn't know the name, but I looked again in our computer files. Braden Chance was a partner in real estate on the fourth floor. He was 44 years old, married, and went to law school at Duke. There were 42 files for River Oaks. Four were about evictions. River Oaks had bought a warehouse on Florida Avenue. On January 27th, some squatters were evicted from the warehouse. One of them, as I now knew, was Devon Hardy. The file on the eviction itself had a number next to it. The number meant that only Braden Chance could open the file. I wrote down the file's name and number and walked down to the fourth floor. When I got there, I saw a legal assistant and asked him where Braden Chance's office was. He pointed to an open door across the hall. Although it was late, Chance was at his desk looking busy. He didn't like me just walking in from the hall. At Drake and Sweeney, you phoned first and made an appointment. But that didn't worry me very much. Chance didn't ask me to sit down, but I did, and he didn't like that either. You were next to the guy when he got shot, he said unpleasantly, after I said Devon Hardy's name. Yes, I said. Terrible for you, huh? It's over. Mr. Hardy, who's now dead, was evicted from a warehouse. Was it one of our evictions? It was, said Chance, but he didn't look at me as he spoke. I guessed that Arthur Jacobs had looked at the file with him earlier in the day. What about it? added Chance. Was he a squatter? Of course he was. They're all squatters, aren't they? Our client just got them out of the warehouse. Are you sure he was a squatter, not a tenant? Chance looked angry. What do you want? Could I see the file? No. Why not? I'm very busy. Will you please leave? If he was a squatter, there's no problem. Why can't I see the file? Because it's mine, and I said no. How's that? Maybe that's not good enough. He stood, his hands shaking as he pointed to the door. I smiled at him and left. The legal assistant from the hall had heard everything and we exchanged looks and smiles as I passed his desk. The man's a fool, he said very quietly. I smiled again. Yes. But what was Chance hiding? There was something wrong, and it was in that file. I had to get it. I went back to my office to think. 
The phone rang. It was Claire. Why are you at the office? She spoke very slowly, and her voice was colder than the snow outside. I looked at my watch. I remembered we had arranged to have dinner together at the apartment. I, uh, well, a client called from the West Coast. I had used this lie before. It didn't matter. I'm waiting, Michael. Should I start to eat? No, I'll be back at the apartment as fast as I can. I ran from the building into the snowstorm, but I didn't really care that another evening together had been ruined. A few hours later, Claire and I were having our coffee by the kitchen window. The snow had finally stopped. I had an idea. Let's go to Florida, I said. She gave me a cold look. Florida? Okay, the Bahamas. We can leave tomorrow. It's impossible. Not at all. I don't have to work for a few days. Why not? Because I'm going crazy. And at Drake and Sweeney, if you go crazy, then you get a few days off. You are going crazy. I know. It's fun, actually. People are nice to you. They smile. Polly brought me cookies today. I like it. The cold look returned, and she said, I can't. And that was the end of that. I knew she couldn't do it. She was a doctor. People had appointments with her. But also, she didn't want to go with me. Okay, I said. Then I'm going to Memphis for a couple of days to see my parents. Oh, really? She said. She didn't even sound interested. I need to see my parents. It's been almost a year, and this is a good time, I think. I don't like the snow, and I don't feel like working. Like I said, I'm going crazy. Claire got up and went to bed. Well... Call me, she said over her shoulder. I knew that was the end of my marriage. And I hated to have to tell my mother. My parents were in their early sixties and trying to enjoy not working for the first time in their lives. Mom had been a bank manager. Dad had been a lawyer in Atlanta. They had worked hard, saved hard, and given me the best of everything. Dad always wanted me to be a lawyer, like him. I rented a car at Memphis Airport and drove east to the rich part of the city where the white people live. The blacks had the center of the city and the whites the area outside. Sometimes the blacks moved out from the center into a white area, and then the whites moved further out. My parents lived on a golf course in a new glass house. You could see the golf course from every window. I had called from the airport, so Mom knew I was coming. What's wrong? She asked me when she saw me. Nothing. I'm fine. Where's Claire? You guys never call us, you know. I haven't heard her voice in two months. Claire's fine, Mom. We're both alive and healthy and working very hard. Are you spending enough time together? No. Are you spending any time together? Not much. I saw the tears in her eyes. I'm sorry, Mom. It's lucky we don't have kids. To talk about something else, I told her the story of Mr. Are you all right? She asked, the look of shock on her face. Of course. I'm here, aren't I? The company wanted me to take a couple of days holiday, so I came home. You poor thing. Claire, and now this. Later that afternoon, my dad and I played golf. Dad, I'm not very happy at Drake and Sweeney, I said. I don't like what I'm doing. 
Welcome to the world, son. You think the guys in factory jobs like what they're doing? You're getting rich. They aren't. Be happy. He was happy. He was winning at the golf. Ten minutes later, he said, Are you changing jobs? I'm thinking about it. Why don't you just say what you're trying to say? As usual, I felt weak and like I was running away from something. I'm thinking about working for the homeless, I said. As a lawyer, I added quickly. Dad didn't stop playing. He hit a ball into the distance. I'd hate to see you throw it all away, son, he said. You'll be a partner in a few years. We walked after his ball. A street guy's killed in front of you and you have to change the world? You just need a few days away from work. Is that all?